your kind and precious heavenly father give you thanks for the opportunity to walk through these doors and to gather here and to uh, study and read your word dear heavenly father and I, I pray for all the prayer requests placed at your feet we know that your will will be done in all this and i pray that we open our hearts our minds our spirit and we're ready to receive this uh word dear heavenly father that we too can apply it to our lives and every day you know so many we we often walk through these doors and read scripture and sing songs and and we and we speak of uh, of a great god that gave us such a forgiving son and but to truly apply that love into our lives and to truly allow and to submit ourselves and allow the lord to guide us through our everyday actions words uh strengths sharing gospel all the challenges we go through dearly father you know that should just shine out through all the ways we communicate dearly father is how often do we fail at all the above but i i give you thanks for uh, being a loving God that forgives us in our, in our shortcomings and allows us to fall, acknowledge that, realize what our shortcomings are, turn around, fall upon our knees, and ask for your forgiveness in those shortcomings and knowing that you love us that much that if we ask from the heart and ask true, truly asking, humbly asking um, for your forgiveness, dear Heavenly Father, that that love and mercy will be granted upon all of us. Please go forth with us uh, as we read this word. Allow it to touch and allow us to grow. And I ask all these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. If you want to turn your Bibles to uh, the book of James, we're going to be working in James chapter 1 and also in James chapter 3. So in the, we're going to be in the book of James. You know, as a, you know, when we reflect back, when we think about like how big and how powerful God is and how meek and how mild his son is, you have to say is. You can't say was because it's not past tense because he's alive. He's alive. He's alive in the word. He's alive within us. He may have died on the cross, right? His blood, his body, his body died on that cross but his spirit lives so we can't speak of Christ in past tense about who he was we can talk about who he is and one of the things that Jesus always said one of his the two words he's talked about I am those are two words I am not I was not who I was it's not in past tense but who I am are the words that he shared many many times and you know just thinking about the life of Jesus here on this earth you know to to realize that you know when he gave water or healed he didn't care who he he didn't care what the lineage of was or the history behind whoever he helped all they had to do was ask all they had to do was ask it, it wasn't about it who who that person was or what they had done just an hour ago whether it was an adultery whether it was a, a Sumerian woman who was a sworn enemy of the Jews he didn't care about any of that stuff he looked at who's in need and who can I provide help to and you know in many ways you know when I parallel some of that you know um, you know this isn't to exalt Joshua or anything like that but when I look at Josh, when I look at the at the folks that he works with at the fire department, you know, it's it's all hours of the day, it's all hours of the night, and it's not always the best situations. It's not always sun shining and unicorns and rainbows and butterflies out there. You know, it's bad situations when bad things happen, whether it's a car wreck or whether it's domestic violence or drug addiction and overdoses or whatever it is. But some inside of each one of these individuals is something that says, I just want to serve. They're not there for money. They're not there for hire. It's all volunteer. But they're there to serve. And he serves with people. I mean, if you look at the DNA, you know, I shared this in the eulogy for, uh, um, for um, Terry's stepdad, Jerry Klein. It was that if you kind of look at the characteristics of a person going... Does that person have the characteristics of 
what Jesus, uh, how Jesus loved us. You know, it's not necessarily that we have we proclaim Jesus Christ on every every breath to everyone outside these walls and everyone we run into. It's not that we share the gospel with every chance we've got or whatever, or we, you know, when we pray in our homes and in our closets and our bedrooms and to ourselves, these are the things that we just do. So we are kind of portraying the DNA of Christ. When you think about like the makeup of who Christ is. And, um, you know, there are many people that uh, Joshua serves the fire department with that, that are not godly people, right? They don't necessarily know who God is. Or they don't necessarily worship him regularly. Um, but there's so many things inside of them, the way they're wired. People are wired a certain way. Boys are wired a certain way. Girls are wired a certain way. God made us that way. It's the way that we think, the way we love, the way we serve, the way we care for one another. Um, to truly be heartbroken over bad things. All that stuff. Those That's the DNA. That's the makeup of who... Christ was, and he, he lives within us. And, and I truly believe, even though someone hasn't fallen upon their knees and received Jesus as their Lord and Savior, yet at the same time, when you th- look back at Jeremiah and you go, when Jeremiah says, I knew you before I formed thee in the womb. And there's so many, I believe that there's so many people, we talk about the lost who hasn't actually fallen upon their knees and hasn't received Jesus Christ as Savior. But yet they still have all that DNA, all that makeup of what Jesus Christ, of the way he loves and the way he gives. And, and just you know, it just kind of hit me going, no, they haven't been saved yet. They don't know who he is yet. By, go- by golly, they sure do act like it. There's so many things that they do that says they act just like Jesus would act. And it's just, and they're so close. And it's just kind of like, it's kind of, I, I, I read a story one time about a mountain climber. And he was on the side of a mountain. And the weather came in during the day. He was delayed coming down the mountain. And it says, rappelling down the mountain, there is no light. It is so dark you can't see, even see your eyes in front of your face, right? Uh, you can't see your hand in front of your face. It is that pitch black. So he's descending down. He's got 500 feet of rope or so. He's descending down, rappelling down, and he finally stopped. He's at the end of that rope. And God told him, and God told this climber who's descending down, he says, he's at the end of the rope. He has no more rope to go. I'm done. It's the middle of the night. He doesn't know where he is. And God spoke to him, and he says, just let go. Just let go of the rope. And, and he had a, and he kind of was in, in tribulation there. You know, I don't know what's below me. I don't know. I don't want to die. I don't want to die, right? They just know he doesn't want to die. So he's at the end of the rope, and finally, when they, when they rescue him, when, they, when the rescuers come, they find this climber that had rappelled down, that had 500 feet of rope, who did not just let go and just fall, and they found him frozen to death three feet off the ground three feet off the ground he didn't know where the bottom was so he didn't let go because he didn't know where the bottom was he had no sight and he just wouldn't let go and there's so many people that are on that ragged edge like and it's it's funny because so many uh have these characteristics of christ in them for example that some of the people that joshua serves with i'm not focusing on them but there's so many people that you know they're caring. Why do they care so much? Why do they love so much? Why do they want to provide so much? It, that DNA, even though they haven't received Christ yet, there's so much of the characteristics of Christ already in them that if they would just let go, just let go, they're right on the ragged edge. They're right on the cusp of salvation and eternity, just on the ragged edge. So a lot of times when we talk about sharing the love of Jesus Christ to this world out there, it's not that you've got to take them from the bottom that don't know anything, that have never heard about Jesus Christ, have no idea what you're talking about. It's not like you've got to bring them from the bottom all the way up to salvation and, and, and up to salvation to receive the grace of God. 
and to, and to be introduced to this merciful God that will forgive them. There are so many that are already almost there. They're almost at the finish line. How many times have you seen a video of a finish line at the end of a marathon and their bodies collapse 100 yards from the finish line? They can just see the finish line right there and their bodies will not work anymore. And somebody picks them up and carries them across the finish line. Uh, somebody picks them up and, and holds them, around, puts their arms around them and let them walk across the finish line. They're so close, the finish line is right there. And there's so many that are lost that are almost right there. So I would encourage us to never, you know, don't stop what we're doing. Don't stop loving. Don't stop sharing. Because there's so many that we've got to just push across the finish line. All we've got to do is just pick them up and carry them across the finish line. They've got to be willing to do that. But so many are so close. And that really stood out to me today as, as I was reading about it. As I was reading and studying and asking the Lord to guide me, it's just, you know, that, that's some of the things that he speaks to me. He's going, there's so many that are lost, but yet are so close. And to not give up sharing that gospel with them. And when we start, if we start in, uh, in the book of James, verse, uh, chapter 1, and we look at verse 5, and it says, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally, and abradeth not, and it shall be given him. Liberally. And when we think about that, how often do we, have we taken a medicine a lotion, an ointment of some sort, and it says apply lib liberally. That's what it says. Apply liberally. And liberally says that I'm going to put on more than I, my, I think my body can typically handle, right? That it's going to be, when I have a wound, i got cuts and wounds all over me anyway. But when I put it on liberally, use that stuff's falling off. i got to watch out where I sit down because it's going to rub off on something. i got to cover it up with a bandage so it doesn't stick to my clothes. Liberally, see, liberally, liberally can be taken as more than enough. Right? And that's the way God is. Right? He says, apply liberally. His generosity is immeasurable. Immeasurable. He's going, because think about that. We're talking about a scale. When we talk about scale, you know, if you talk about models, something is a half scale. So that means it's half the size of the real thing, right? Or a quarter scale is 25% size of the real thing. Like, in my, like me, I love airplanes, uh, RC airplanes and things like that. And when I want to build an airplane that looks like a real airplane, but I want to fly it and it looks like a real airplane, they're usually in scale. And, and literally, it's a half or a third or a quarter of the size of a real one. So if we talk about scale, we've got to think about, what am I scaling it to? So if I'm talking about an airplane, I'm scaling it to what the size of a full-size airplane would be. But if I'm talking about scale and I'm talking about Christ, what is that scale now? Because now that's a really, really big scale, right? I want to be 100%. Jesus Christ, and I want to be perfect just like him. But many times I find ourselves, you know, we're going to find ourselves that, um, like again, what do we compare ourselves against when we say, how am I performing as a Christian? Do I believe? Do I pray? Do I love? Do I, do, uh, I share? Do I provide? And all these things. Uh, compare to what? And again, we've got to compare ourselves we're going to scale ourselves. We've got to be comparing to who Jesus Christ is. In the words, abradeth not, further explain the goodness of God. He does not look for ways to avoid giving us what we have. He does not look for ways to avoid giving us what we have. Joshua, in it, once he uh, graduated high school um, and was going to college, and applying to Liberty University, we were looking for certain things. And uh, we were looking for some help, maybe with scholarships or things like that. And, but, you know, so yeah, he could be a candidate for a scholarship, but he had to have submitted some information at a certain date. He had to have had these little, these other things that made him qualify 
to receive a scholarship or to receive something. There always seems to be a catch, right? You can, you can go buy a car and buy it at this price if you can put a certain number of dollars down. If you can finance it for three years and not six years, there's always this catch. And it always seems, and we're always looking as we're buying and doing things in our lives and, and just living our lives. And, and when somebody's offering us a deal, if you want to call it what a deal is, there's always a catch in there some way. And we're always hunting and we're guarded going, so what's the catch? You want to come to my house? I, I mean, I ran to a guy who's got a freezer in the back of his truck and he's got all these steaks that are for sale. And um, he wants to, and they're worth a thousand dollars. He wants to sell them to me for 150 bucks, $150 for a thousand dollars worth of steaks. What's the catch? We're always looking for the, what the catch is. So what it does is it puts us in a very defensive mode. Our minds are always defensive. Somebody is always trying to take advantage of us. Here on this earth, somebody is trying to take advantage of us. There's not a, really a deal out there. And so we're always looking for the catch. And one of the things that I love about these words here that we're reading tonight, when he said the words abradeth not when it says who giveth to all men liberally and abradeth not it should be given to him realizing that when god's talking to us there is no catch he wants you to get it all he says i want you to get oh, i want you to get all the gift and all the love that i have to offer you whatever that gift is however big that gift is salvation the biggest gift he can give us is forgiveness and salvation and eternity. That's the biggest gift he can give us. And when it says abradeth not, it's going like, it's like almost you get to heaven, you're almost there, but I got gotcha. you. You know, you can't go because of whatever, whatever, or, you know, he's not holding back. He's going, there is no catch. He says, I want all of you. I want you to recognize that there is no catch. I want you to recognize when I told you to love, I told you to pray, I told you to provide, I told you to give, when I told you to do all these things, there is no catch to it. And if you don't do one of those things, if I told you to do 10 things and you don't only, only did eight things, I'm going to forgive you for the two that you didn't do. And I'm going to love you for who you were trying to be. Who you were trying to be. It's not that hard. I love the fact that, that God gave us the chance and it, there's no catch to salvation in eternity with him. There is no falling short. There's no such thing as falling short. When we submit ourselves and we say, I'm going to be better. I'm going to be good. I'm going to be loving. I'm going to keep doing all these things. I'm going to be as Christ-like as I can be. I love knowing that a God says, I'm going to accept. Once you say, I want to be like you. I'm going to live like you. I want to pray like you. I want everything you have to offer. There is no catch to what he wants to give us. He wants to give us all of it. And when we fall short, I believe he wants to forgive us from where we fell short and we're going through anyway. In verses, uh, that same uh, James chapter 1, verses 6 through 8, and we read these words, it says, But let him ask in faith nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. God is ready to answer our prayers, but our prayers have to be real ones. This is real prayers. One condition in true prayer is faith. The knowing. Faith says that I know that my Lord will provide for me. That I know with every ounce, every being, every cell in my body, I know for a fact that the Lord will get me through whatever I'm getting through. Now, the results not, might, might not always be ideal. You know, the results might not end up perfect, but the results are going to be exactly what God intended them to be. And to be, so whenever we ask, we have to be ready. We have to be ready to receive whatever, whatever that outcome may be. But to truly, truly uh, to trust in him.
So we have to, and the faith involves trusting God's goodness to give us what we need and believing in God's power to meet our needs. The opposite kind of faith is described in the last part of verse 6 and 7 and 8. It's, and that's talking about doubting. Either the goodness or power of God is the opposite of faith. Any doubt. This is big, God. What I'm getting ready to go through is big. And I'm going to ask you for it. But I'm also, you know, I'm, I'm going to ask you to, to heal me. I'm going to ask you to get me through whatever I'm going through. I'm going to ask you, God. Um, but I'm also going to take and do some other things to make sure I'm covered, for example. God, I have no idea how I'm going to take and, and, and pay my bills. I have no idea how I'm going to get through whatever this is in front of me or whatever. So I'm going to pray to you, God, to heal me, to get me through whatever I'm going through. But just in case, I'll tell you what, I'm going to get a second and third opinion. I'm going to have an, a fallback plan. I'm going to have an alternative. So in case you don't pull through, I'm going to have something else that's going to catch me, for example. We have to believe with all of our heart, mind, soul, and body that he will deliver as he promised he would deliver. And we have to be accepting of the results that he has given to us. Doubters are compared to the waves of the sea. The waves are constantly changing because of they, because they are subject to the power of the wind. The waves, the trouble, that says that it's not constant. It's not like every. There's no rhythm to it. Usually, there's a rhythm to something. You know, uh, whether it's in music or whether it's in, um, or even when we when we do talk about waves. When we do go to the ocean, I was just there a few weeks ago, and you look at it, and waves come, and then there's a lull, then waves come, and um, but when we're talking about a sea here, when we have wind and and the moon drawing on the earth and all these things, the the waves can go in different directions. They can shift to the north, they can shift to the south. They can be big, they can be small. There's so many variables to it, right? That make makes the makes these waves unpredictable. Right, and that's what God's saying. He says, with that mind, with that mind, and with that doubt that we have, it makes it very hard to have a smooth rhythm where God will work, and you'll be challenged, and God will work and show you exactly who He is again, and then you're going to get through it. And there will be a constant. There is a constant storm, but it's very. It has a very distinct rhythm to it. But the fact when we put doubt into the mix of it then there is no rhythm. There is no anticipation of what is the next storm. Because the next storm can be a year from now or 10 years from now. The next storm, whatever it is that we're going to go through. And doubt is what adds the consistency. I can fight a battle if I know when it's coming and how often it's coming. How often am I going to be challenged? If I know that, if I could look on a calendar that says, every thir- at the end of every third month, I'm going to have something challenge me. Physically, financially, uh, psychologically, spiritually, whatever it is. I know on this day, I'm going to get this challenge. And then three months later, I'm going to get this challenge. And I can brace myself and ready myself for that. But if I don't know when the storm's coming, and I don't know when those challenges are, and how big they're going to be, maybe it's a little one or a big one, you can't prepare yourself to fight that battle. And that's what doubt does with us. That's what doubt does. That's why the relationship is so important with him. Verse 8 describes people as when it says here, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Double-minded. That sheds more light on what James really meant when he was contrasting faith and doubt. Faith is a single-minded commitment to the Lord. Doubt is trying to serve God and also live for ourselves, something that Jesus said was impossible. In Matthew 6, chapter, uh, chapter 6, verse 24, it says, No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and money. You cannot serve God and yourself. We cannot use the words and, the word and, with anything. We're talking about serving the Lord. There is no and. There is no something else. We can't serve him and us. We can't serve him and this church. We can't serve him and our loved ones and family. 
is like we just serve him and the outcome will be exactly what God designed it designed it to be exactly Let's go over to James chapter 3. And we're going to skip down to verse 2. Chapter 3, verse 2. For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man and able also to bridle the whole body. We notice that James continues to use the word we. Right? For in many things we offend all. I love that when we use the word we. Because James realizes here that when it's we, we're talking about all Christians. It's not going about I. He's not saying James. He, if, if James was talking about James, he would have said I. If in many things I offend, he says, but it's we. It's, it's believers. It's all the disciples. It's everyone carrying this message of God, of, of Jesus Christ out there. We've got to remember this is a new message, right? That most people haven't heard about this Jesus Christ, right? So I love the fact that he used the word we. It says that it also includes me and him and the disciples and everyone else that claims to be a, a, a Christian. He is aware that he and his fellow believers are not perfect. They continue to fall short in many ways. Most fell short quickly in their use of words. James had teachers especially in mind when he broadened his application to how any group uses the gift of speech. In many ways, controlling what we say is the supreme test. Controlling what we say. This is something, I can tell you this. This is something that I fail at every single day. Every day I fight this. If I would say something is my Achilles heel, it is absolutely my mouth and my mind. Right? It's the attitude that we choose to walk with. Right? Um, we're going to walk with and speak like those words should sound like a loving God out there. But what happens is we wrap our emotions up in what we think and what we say if we're frustrated you're going to hear that we're frustrated if we're mad you're going to hear that we're mad if if i feel loving and and you're going to you're going to hear those words and see those actions because our words are typically based upon our emotions right so controlling is the is the supreme test Whoever can control their tongue can usually, is usually able to exercise self-control over the rest of their lives. Over the rest of their lives. They're going, it's just about the tongue. It's just something I said. What we say is directly attached to our emotions. And where we stand mentally, psychologically, in our minds, how do we stand? It's one thing to... It's one thing to be frustrated internally. But it's another thing to go, how do I deal with that frustration? How can I be frustrated as a, as a man or as a person? How can I be frustrated or angered or whatever I'm or hurt or sad or whatever emotion I'm dealing with at that time? How do I deal with that and yet at the same time come across a young, uh, another person that doesn't know Christ yet and share the love of Christ. Well, the words coming out of my mouth, do they sound like the words of a loving God out there? Or do they sound like the words of me? Or you? We? Us? Typically not. There's periods of time where I just get quiet. Because if I don't get quiet, I'm going to say things and hurt feelings. It's just what I do. When I'm at work and and things aren't going well or whatever it is or wherever I am, work, home, whatever. There's certain times in our lives where I'm, and, and they say, David, why are you shutting down? Why are you communicating? I'm like, I, you don't want to hear what I have to say. I have to, you know, I don't, want to, I don't want to hurt our relationship. I don't want to say bad things. I don't want you to think ill of me. So I'll just settle down. Let me, let me kind of decompress and figure out where we stand 
you know, maybe I need to communicate in a, in a different way. So it's better for me to be quiet during this period of time. So the things that I do say are loving, are Christ-like, and constructive that we can build off of. One of the things I would think I, that, you know, just hit me as just now t- uh, talking with you is, is, you know, when we talk about people in our lives, people in our lives are either holding us back or pushing us forward. One or the other. They're not doing, they're not doing, but they're doing either or. Either we're, either we're growing or we're not growing or we're failing. And... Um, it's almost the same way with uh, when we talk about our words. Either we're constructive or we're destructive. There's typically not a middle ground right there. Something has to happen, and uh, unfortunately, they're on polar opposites. And one of the things about Christ, it, even if he had, didn't have to say a word, even if it was just about an action, when he picked up somebody and he healed them, when he provided water to someone who was thirsty, when he provided whatever he provided them with, he did that regardless of his emotions. How heartbroken do you think he was when all when he says, I was born of God, his son. You know, I was born for these people, and yet they turned their backs on me. When, when his disciples and the people who followed him and shared the gospel... When they were being stoned and beaten and tortured and killed, do you think Jesus was angry? I'll guarantee you he was heartbroken because it wasn't received the way you would think someone would want to receive salvation and eternity. They should be joyful to meet my disciples. They should be joyful to hear about the Son of God. They should be joyful that they can have eternity. They should be joyful that they, can be, that they are able to be forgiven. With just with all they have to, is just to receive me, and how heartbroken he was to do that. But his love and his words never showed the emotion of Jesus Christ. He only showed love. He only showed mercy. He only showed miracles, even when he was heartbroken and angry and sad and all those things. He we got to remember that he did have to come here on this earth to be a, a human being the Son of God, but he had to feel pain and know what emotions are. What is sadness? What is happiness? What is heartbreak? What are all those things? That's one of the things that, that, that's why he had to be here, so that believers that are young, or or people that didn't know who Christ was, when it's introduced to Christ, you know, he had to love, he had to love them all, and they needed to see that love being constant. How can a per you know, what is so special, or that is what makes Christ so special is, is regardless of his emotions, he still loved and provided anyway. He still forgave. He still granted mercy. He still healed. He did all those things. Even to his enemies. And we've got to think about who is our enemies. We go, and, and if we talk about uh, the Sumerian, for example, a sworn enemy of the Jews. Who would provide for them? And I think that when we think about like who are good guys and bad guys, or who, uh, if you think about, we always compare good and evil, right? <laughs> I love the fact that Jesus, you know, when you think about that, Jesus didn't put anybody in a bucket. He didn't sort them out. He didn't sort out the, you know, one of the projects I did with a robotics program with the scouts or the, the school one, one of the things we did was we would look and we put a whole pile of marbles in a bucket and there were five different colors and there were a hundred marbles, five or ten different colors and we would analyze the color and sort them and the white ones are over here and the blue ones are over there and the yellow ones are over here. We would sort them all out. You know, when you think about that, Jesus did not sort out who mankind is. Good guys, bad guys, Sumerians, Israelites, Moors, whatever it is out there he didn't put them in buckets how easily and and you know as i'm saying those words at the same time i put people in buckets all day long you you, i can you can look at them you can see how they talk how they dress the language they use 
the hostility, the cars they drive, the house they live in, the clothes they wear. I can fit anybody in a bucket. We're quick to do that. I mean, if you think about that, we're the first, I mean, we're human beings. We judge people, even though we're not supposed to judge, we judge them fast. When somebody's coming up to me dressed in a certain way with a bucket sticking out of their hand, and I know those guys want a dollar or a quarter or a sandwich or whatever it is, I know exactly what's coming at me. I've already judged them. I've already judged them. (laughs) But think about Christ. He's going, you're coming at me dressed a certain way from a certain house and and speaking a certain language and, and doing good things or bad, whatever you are. He didn't care who you were. I love that about Christ, that he didn't care who you were. He just knew you weren't as good as he was because he was perfect. And there's something he can do for you. And I love that. One of the things that, uh, you know, with with Christians in general and just good people, they're always concerned about somebody else. You know, John came up to me this evening going, hey, did we get a fruit basket for uh, Brother Roger? You know, maybe we need to do something for Gail. We're always looking like, what can we do as a body of Christ, as South River Baptist Church, as this organization is, what can we do? You know, and and what can we do for others? I think it's what really stands out from a Christian is the fact that what can I do for somebody else? What can we do collectively? What can we do individually? What can I do for somebody else? We're looking for that. Same thing the volunteers with the fire department. Who can I go help? Who can I go save? Who can I pull out of a car? Whose house can I, can I, a house fire can I put out? Who, who's, whose teenage son just overdosed on drugs and is dead in the front yard? Who can I go save with some medication and a little bit of attention? Who can I do? They don't walk in there going, hey, oh, you're, you live in that community, or you live your life this way, or whatever it is. You think those guys are cr- trying to qualify whether they're going to help somebody or not? They don't care where you are, what you drive, what you look like. That's the same love. When I'm talking about the characteristics and DNA of, of Jesus Christ, that's exactly what it looks like. I don't care who you are. I love exactly who you are. I don't care what color your skin is or what language you speak or what your heritage is. It means nothing to me. Jesus Christ, it didn't make any difference to him. Why does it make any difference to me? In, and then same thing in chapter 3 if we move down to verses 3 and 4 it says behold we put bits in the in the horses mouths that they may obey us and we turn about their whole body in verse 4 it says behold also the ships which though they be so great and are driven of fierce winds yet they are turned about with a very small helm, whatever, whether soever the governor listeneth. James gave two examples of something small that exercised control over something so big. When you got a wild horse, I knew this when I was, I've been away from it for a long time. I grew up with, with neighbors who had horses and barrel races, stuff like this. We have a lovely friend of the family that spends a lot of time with a a big horse lover, owns horses, rides, and wants to go down that field as a career. You know, we had a young man staying with us, and he grew up, you know, raising horses, riding horses, breaking horses, doing all those things. And 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 he had to. And whenever you have a horse that doesn't want to be controlled, you got to put a bit in its mouth. Most of them have bits when you're riding, but there's certain bits that do certain things. They apply a certain amount of pressure in the corner of the cheeks of their mouths, for example. They're rigid. I can take a 1,500-pound animal, and I can stop him dead in his tracks, and I can turn him right around on his, on his back legs if I wanted to because what it does is we can get full control over that. And talking about the ships, how big a ship is, 1,000 feet long, some of these freighters and oil tankers 700 feet a thousand feet long and you look relative to the size of the ship look how big that rudder is on there and yet they're able to steer something so big and so massive with such a small thing james points out that the tongue controls the whole body But if a person could control just the tongue, 
he would have the discipline to control all of his actions just by controlling the tongue. Lastly, in verse 5 of chapter 3, Even so the tongue is a little member and boasteth great things. Behold how great a matter a little fire kindleth. In the first two, in the first verses of two and four, James wrote that the people who can control what they say are people of exceptional discipline. In verse five, this verse, James noted that although the tongue is small, a small part of the human body, this small member is loud and it's boasting and great in its influence for evil. That tongue can do so much good. The words that we share can do so good. And yet those, that, that very same tongue that, that helps us pronounce those very same words can be so destructive. And our mouths, our mouths are linked to our minds, linked to what we think and how we communicate. And it too, just like a bridle on a horse's mouth or a rudder on a ship, can steer a relationship. That tongue can tear down decades of relationships. How many houses, how many friendships, how many families have been broken and torn apart because of just those words? I hear it all the time. We hear stories all the time of how someone hasn't communicated with someone for so, so long. And there's all this animosity between loved ones, between family, between family. We know, I know, I personally know families who haven't spoken to other parts of families for literally decades because of something that was said decades ago. And they don't even remember what the fuss was about. And it probably didn't mean much anyway. It definitely wasn't worth destroying a family or destroying a relationship or a friendship. And let's get down to chapter 3, and we're going to read this last verse, and we're going to read the chapter, uh, verse 13 of chapter 3. And the word of the Bible reads, it says, Who is a wise man and, in, and, who is a wise man and endured with knowledge among you? Let him shew out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. With meekness of wisdom. The question is, in this verse implies that some of James' readers, though themselves especially wise, however, James pointed out that true wisdom is not shown by boasting. Instead, real wisdom is shown by a way of life that doesn't need to boast of its accomplishments. The good life, as James writes, repeats the familiar theme in James. True wisdom like true religion and faith, shows itself in its good works. I've run across many professionals in, in, in my line of work, and I always tease, not tease, but I've always pointed out from time to time, people like to tell you how good they are. I'm the best. I'm the best. You know, I'm reliable. I'm on time, you can count on me, I'm a provider. They, they always use these words, they describe themselves as who they are or whatever. And, you know, some of the people in my line of work that I've known in my past, you know, I've, I've made a comment before, if you don't know how good he is, just give him about 15 minutes, he's gonna let you know how good he is. I'm the best. Because people are, it's pride. All it is is just pride. Going, that's what, that's what we're announcing. We're prideful in our accomplishments. We're prideful in, in what we know and stuff like that. Th those things, that, that's just pride. We build ourselves up so that I don't have to start at ground zero. What you think about me, I don't have to start at ground zero. I'm going to tell you what I'm capable of, and we're going to start in the middle, or maybe a little above middle, and then I'm going to show you the rest of it, how good I am. You go, oh, wow, he's good. But how many times, you know, but one of the things that you always look for is goes, show me. Show me. When you, when, you have, when you run across someone 
that and you're using their services for example and they say yeah i'm going to give i'm going to do the best job for you i'm going to arrive early i'm going to communicate i'm going to do all these things you can say all those things but you've got to follow up with all the actions the actions have to follow those words it's about our actions it says in that last part of verse 13 it says let him show out of a good life his works with meekness and wisdom. This is, I believe and know the words that I say. Wisdom. There's one thing to have knowledge. It's another thing to have wisdom. I know a lot of people that can quote this Bible from front to back, from Genesis to Revelation. They can pull scripture out at any given opportunity and quote it all day long. But to truly live it and understand it and breathe it and let it be every part of your being is where the wisdom comes in. Knowledge says I memorize something. I, you know, someone speaks about sadness. Someone speaks about how to be a Christian when we're studying the book of Acts, for example. How to act as a Christian. How to be. But it's another thing to apply. Everything that we hear, everything that we learn, Everything that we received as a gift from God to understand and have that relationship with him and to be able to apply it in meekness is the, going to be the opposite of what that pride is. Pride says, I want to tell you how good I am. Meekness says, I'll tell you what, let me just show you how good I am and how effective that is to show somebody uh, to show somebody who you are, to show somebody who God is. This is, not a, this is not a war in a, in a way that we have spiritual wars between good and evil, between God and the devil. We have that kind of war going on. But when you want to show the impact of how powerful God is, look at his people and look at how in all these people that proclaim to be, uh, to be believers in Christ, how do they act? Do they act like Christ? Do they communicate like Christ? Do they provide like Christ? Do they do all these things? That's where the meekness comes from. Instead, instead of being boastful, let me tell you who I am and what I teach and what I study and all the things that I've done to show the world that I love just like Christ did. How many families did I provide for? How many whatevers did I do? I showed exactly who the love of Christ is because I want them to, because I'm talking about me again. Meekness says, I'm going to get meekness. Those two words, M-E, in the beginning of meekness. So, <laughs> meekness, you got to get me, i got to get me out of this thing. Meekness says, I'm going to show you with me out of it. I'm going to show you exactly who Christ is. And that's one of the biggest battles I believe we have as Christians is getting ourselves out of the way so that those that don't know the Lord yet can understand how big he is and, and and the thing is to understand how big God is and how capable he is to understand that we have to live it and experience it I can't tell you about it. I can tell you about it I can tell you about it but the thing is until you experience the love of Christ and go through it with him whether it is something, a blessing in your life, and he, you asked and he provided, whether it, when he, or he gets you through that difficult situation, whatever it is, and he gets you on the other side of that because you truly believed and you approach God and says, You're my, I have no secondary plan. You, Lord, is all I'm putting all my energy and prayer and belief in that you're going to get me through this. And once he gets you on the other side, and he's proven exactly who he is, you submitted yourself. You said, I'm going to ask only you, God, to help me get through this. And once he delivers, once you experience the love of Jesus Christ, once you experience that, then truly, then you believe. Then you are a follower. Then you do it again and again. And you realize that every time I have this need, or never, every time I have this, maybe I don't even need anything. I just want to acknowledge what he's done for me. It's not necessarily that it has to provide for me, but I want to acknowledge, God, what you have done for me. And just that acknowledgement lets him know, going, just that acknowledgement says that, God, creator, 
Your son was worth it to die on the cross for me. Jesus, the fact that you felt all that pain and got hung on that cross and gave up your body just for me, just to be born, you would do it just for me. He did it for all of us, but I know for a fact that he loved me that much that he would have been born, died on that cross just for me. And every time we take and walk with him and pray with him and acknowledge him, he says that sacrifice was worth it. I would do it all over again. I would do it all over again. Even just for one, I would do it all over again. It's incredible having a a God that big. And I think it's really hard for us to wrap our heads around how loving he is and how forgiving he is. I have I fail every single day. I know I fail every single day. And yet I can fail every day and yet I can still know that he still loves me and he's still supporting me and I believe he's still cheering me on. When I have something come up in my life, he's going, "Man, just just call on me. I want to hear those words." And then all of a sudden then you call on him. And go, oh, he realized that I am here. And you realize that, that I can get him through or get you through whatever you're going through. It's just, and how proud he must be. And that says that the sacrifice was worth it all. When a young child was growing up and you wake up, Joshua, wake up, make your bed, brush your teeth, put your clothes on, go to the school, get on from school, eat a snack, study every day. Wake up, make your bed, brush your teeth, get your clothes on. And sooner or later, somebody's waking up. Somebody's making their bed. Somebody's brushing their teeth. And you didn't have to say anything. It becomes a habit. And that's, what, and that's, what, that's kind of the, the way that relationship is. Going As young Christians, all of a sudden he goes, I'm going to call upon him. I'm, and it, sooner or later, you're going to stop trying to deal with things by yourself. Then, then call on him when you're hopeless. When things are just so and so in so much despair an eminent failure and everything else. Then you call him as our last resort. When all of a sudden he's going to see us calling upon him early, walking through whatever we have going on through our lives with him. He's going to start seeing that. And not that he told us to, all of a sudden he's going to see that, that habit, that natural reaction. We're going to call on him. We're going to walk with him. We're going to share with him. And we're going to love just like he did. Let's bow our head in prayer. Dear kind and precious Heavenly Father, I, I give you thanks for the words that we receive from the from the bible from the book of james dear heavenly father and i i give you thanks for the this breathed word of god that was penned down uh just for us christians dear heavenly father i, I love having the 66 books of this bible right here that, that takes us all the way from creation all the way through uh salvation all the way through revelations you reveal what a magnificent creator you are you reveal um, how much you loved us, how much you loved y- your children, how much you loved us to give us your son, to realize that we're not perfect and there was no way that we could be perfect enough in order to spend any eternity with you, dear Heavenly Father, and that you acknowledge that. You gave us your son to die on that cross for us. You gave us that son for uh, each of us to be invited to receive him so that we can be cleansed, dear Heavenly Father. And wherever we fall short, we know that Jesus Christ stands in that gap and he, we are forgiven for those failures. And to realize that you know, we're there to spend an eternity with you, Lord, that our lives here on this earth are just, just a blink of the eye, just how fast time goes by relative to eternity, dear Heavenly Father. Our short years on this earth are just so small compared to forever and forever. I give you thanks for being a forgiving God. And, and accepting us in all of our failures and I, and I pray that each of us you know when we try to when we size ourselves up when we, when we try to say you know what kind of Christian am I that we continue to use Christ as our as our model to, to love like he did to not be judgmental to not put people in buckets not to label them but to love unconditionally in just the same way you loved us dear Heavenly Father I pray for I pray for a safe passage. I pray for each of us who came to worship you, dear Lord. 
I pray that you touch the lives of all the prayer requests placed at your feet, dear Heavenly Father, knowing that your will will be done in all those that we ask. I, I pray for your guidance for us as, as family, as parents, as grandparents, as Christians. You guide us, dear Heavenly Father, so that we too can shine a light and attract uh, all those in a lost and dying world to you so they can receive you as their Lord and Savior. And until we meet again, dear Heavenly Father, I pray that we glorify you and exalt you in all of our words and all of our actions, dear Heavenly Father, and forgive us for our sins. And ask all these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen.